We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, good afternoon everyone, and welcome to this main session of the IGF focusing on how can we achieve a multilingual internet. This session is also co-organized by many of our partners, including those of the Policy Network on Meaningful Access, that I am very proud of chairing, co-chairing with my colleague Silvia Cadena of APNIC. So welcome all of you here physically in the room, as well as to those online. It's a pleasure to have you all. Um, we have just finished a very interesting session that the Policy Network organized, and so many of the themes that were discussed are very relevant to this conversation. But I want to move very quickly because we have two amazing keynote speakers to start this session, Doreen Bogdan Martin of the ITU, as well as Dr. Jalassi of UNESCO. And it is my honor to be here with them and everyone that is going to join us for this session. Um, we are going to focus today in this main session on why it's so important that we think about local languages in the context of meaningful, universal connectivity. And with that in mind, I am going to first introduce Doreen Bogdan Martin, who most of you already know. She's spoken quite a few times here at IGF this week. Um, I'm a big fan of Doreen for many reasons, but mostly because she's been an incredible advocate for digital inclusion and digital equality in our space for many years. And she is the first ever woman leader of the ITU development sector. So we are very proud of your work, Doreen, not just as professionals, but as women in technology in our world of IGF. Welcome to the session, and I'm gonna pass you the word right away uh, for your uh, keynote introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm blushing. <laughs> Thank you for that very, very kind uh, opening. And it's great to be part of this IGF session on one of the most critical issues for universal digital inclusion. Uh, I've been asked today to, to share some framing remarks on what, uh, what constitutes what we call meaningful connectivity. For me, that's an issue that's been much on my mind because last week the ITU launched new figures on the state of connectivity around the world. Those new data, I think were broadly encouraging with the disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic translating into this steep rise in the numbers coming online. We estimate about 800 million new users that connected between 2019 and 2021. Of course, that's the strongest growth we've seen in over a decade of uh, bringing the total of people online to 4.9 billion. Uh, but as I said yesterday in the IGF opening, that's positive news. But of course, as often, statistics can mask a more nuanced picture because it's clear that a large portion of those 4.9 billion currently counted as connected actually don't enjoy the kind of connectivity that all of us rely on every day. Many of them are not what we would call meaningfully connected. So what do we mean by meaningful co connectivity? Well, let me start with the Broadband Commission, the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development. And, and, and Sonia is an active member in that group. And I want to recognize uh, my partner and my co-lead, the ADG, Jalassi from UNESCO. In the commission, we define the term as broadband that's available, that's accessible, that's relevant, affordable, that's also safe, trusted, and agency building. In a nutshell, we mean connectivity that, that people can use freely whenever they need it to make a tangible difference in their lives. So IT statistics show that about 95% of the world's population are within reach of a mobile broadband signal. 
So that means that they could theoretically connect, yet 2.9 billion people are totally offline. Of course, as we know, and we've heard in different sessions here at the IGF this week, the barriers to connectivity are many. And of course, affordability is a big one. The skills piece is another one. But our analysis, and of course, the focus of the discussion here today, shows that a lack of compelling, actionable content in relevant languages remains one of the most important blocks to wider internet uptake. Most of us are familiar with the figure, an estimated 7,000 languages and dialects. Only about 10 have any substantial online presence. And of course, that means that thousands of indigenous minority and low resource languages are actually excluded. And with them, that means that millions are cut off from the benefits and also the opportunities of the digital world. Language is so much more than just syntax and, and phonetics. The languages we speak are integral to our identity. Language defines the way that we view the world, the way that we interact with others, and the way that we express our own unique realities. We will never achieve our vision of an internet united if we do not ensure that the online world actually reflects and amplifies the full diversity of our human experience and of course all of its richness. And of course, that means that there can be no universal meaningful connectivity until we achieve a truly multilingual online space. Uh, we have made some progress with the creation of international domain names. I think that was one step forward. And of course, technologically, the technological advances like online translation engines, multilingual voice-driven interfaces, and new AI-powered language processing systems are all helping to expand the internet's linguistic capabilities. But technology is no magic bullet. The reality is that very few online language tools have been developed for lesser used languages. And while powerful machine learning technologies require huge amounts of data to train on literally billions of words and of course thousands of hours of speech. These rich data sets that we need are not available for all languages, nor do many minority language speakers have the means or the skills to develop strategies to promote their own languages online. Clearly relying on technology alone is not gonna be enough. And I think that's why working together and incorporating grassroots efforts by local communities needs to be a key element of, of our work. I was encouraged to read recently of a, a new partnership between digital language activists in Africa that are working with organizations like Wikimedia uh, to improve online presence of widely spoken languages like Isi Zulu, like Dagbani, Igbo, Akan, and others. Of course, even in Europe here, we have Norway, uh, with the Sami Parliament and the Ar Arctic University of Tromso that are collaborating on free accessible technologies for Sami speakers, including keyboards, uh, spell checkers and machine translation systems. And of course, just this week, the Indian government affirmed its commitment to a multilingual internet as part of its digital India vision, engaging with uh, with tech partners, civil society, and academia to promote regional languages that will help then support digital inclusion. So just to, to wrap up, and, and, and Sonia, many of, of the participants I see here with us today, I want to link back, of course, to the Tunis agenda adopted by the World Summit on the Information Society. And I see Marcus Kumar, who was very active in that summit with us today. Um, so that summit back in 2005 could not have been clearer about the importance of multilingualism to bridging the digital divide. Uh, so we still have much work to do. And in my own organization in the ITU, we have our resolution 133 that reaffirms ITU member states commitment to linguistic diversity and equality. In just a few days, we're gonna celebrate the beginning of the decade of indigenous languages and to reflect that, I'm pleased to inform you that next year's WISIS Forum will have a special track on ICTs and Indigenous peoples and cultures 
We'll have a hackathon. We'll have our WISIS prizes. So I hope you'll, you'll join us for that. As digital services continue to expand into every aspect of our lives and our economies, the benefits of connectivity have never been greater. And so ensuring that everyone can access and everyone can benefit from those opportunities, regardless of where they live or the languages they speak, is absolutely fundamental to our vision of a connected planet and, of course, our pledge to leave no one behind. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be here with you. I look forward to the discussion and, of course, even more importantly, to working with all of you as we work to build a richer, more equitable online space where each and every person has the opportunity to make their voice heard. Thanks so much. Back to you, Sonia. Thank you so much, Doreen, for those inspiring words. And I have to say, I very much like your focus on the diversity of the human experience, a point that uh, Sylvia and others made in the previous session, and one that is so critical for all the work that we have ahead of us, as you said. And also, uh, the fact that so much of the work that you and your colleagues at the UN are organizing are also taking a new shape, right, in refocusing on a lot of these issues that are so critical for not just universal access in general, but all, these, all of the dimensions of universal access, including uh, multilingualism. So this is really encouraging to hear. Thank you for your leadership, Doreen, um, again. And I am very, very uh, pleased and honored that not only I get to introduce Doreen, that I'm already a fan, but another person that I'm also a big fan, especially the work of your team, which has been fantastic, uh, Dr. Taufik Jalassi who is uh, the UNESCO Assistant Director General for Communications and Information since 2021 and has already been a um, spokesperson in so many spaces. Uh, it feels like you've been with us for many years. So welcome and please share your remarks uh, to us, to our colleagues here uh, in person and online today. Thank you, Dr. Jalassi. Thank you very much, Sonia, for your kind introduction. Hello, Doreen. Nice to see you on screen. Doreen and ITU, our partner, partner of UNESCO in the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development. Let me add uh, uh, maybe a few remarks to what Doreen has eloquently said in framing the topic and opening this session. We all recognize that languages are a core element of human rights, and of course, they are the repositories of our traditions, values, and knowledge. The key question, of course, is what do we do about multilingualism and linguistic diversity in the cyberspace? And what UNESCO in particular, since I wear that hat, what UNESCO has been doing uh, in, uh, to contribute to the effort to multi, of multiple parties to ensure that we can achieve a truly multilingual internet. Uh, and Doreen has said, if we don't do that, then obviously we are going to leave behind significant parts of the population worldwide, and no, nobody wants us to end with that. Uh, Doreen referred to the 2005 uh, World Summit on the Information Society in Tunis. It happened that I was a guest speaker in that event. I wasn't part of the UN. And clearly, this was a groundbreaking event that brought about the concept of establishing an information society. How can it be if it's not multilingual in the cyberspace? So let me here focus on what UNESCO has been doing. Uh, and here I will mention four initiatives. Initiative number one, the UNESCO recommendation concerning the promotion and use of multilingualism and universal access to cyberspace. Uh, we do have at UNESCO a number of recommendations. The latest one voted uh, a couple of weeks ago by our 193 member states on the ethics of artificial intelligence. So here I wanted to stress this UNESCO recommendation to promote the use of multilingualism in cyberspace. The second action I would like to mention, and Doreen actually hinted to it, she did briefly mention it. We did organize in 2019 the International Year on, uh, of Indigenous Languages, which was highly successful. And now we are about to kick off, in, in, in a one month's time, the International Decade of Indigenous Languages 2022-2032. 
So this is very, very important for us to, to raise global awareness of the importance of indigenous languages. Why? Because we know that in the world there are more than 7,000 languages. But how many of them are present in cyberspace? Mm -hmm. The latest statistic I have is 130 out of 7,000 languages. So clearly, when we talk about digital divide, it's not only whether the person has a, a PC, a tablet, a smartphone, or the person can financially afford paying for internet subscription, but how if the person cannot understand the content that is offered online because it's not in his or her uh, native language or, 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 or home language. So the, the digital divide would include as well the linguistic uh, issue here. And uh, this, this uh, international decade of indigenous languages is a very important opportunity, as we see it, to mobilize the international community to advance the multilingualism issue, including in cyberspace. The third action I would mention is uh, what we did last month at UNESCO, which is launching the World Atlas of Languages, which is a digital platform to, to offer uh, the rich uh, linguistic diversity because it reports more than 8,300 languages, spoken and signed languages in the world. Uh, we believe this is very important to preserve some of the languages that are at risk in different parts of society and also to, to, to give uh, or to increase the profile of these languages across the world. Uh, the, the fourth action here is uh, what UNESCO has been doing to support the African Language Program, uh, project, uh, which is a project that spread heads the Open for Global Alliance, with the aim being to develop an African language data set and advance participatory language technology development. Again, Doreen did refer to some of these language technologies from speech recognition to obviously uh, text to speech uh, and the like. Uh, so let me highlight here that uh, and echo what was already said, we need to join forces, we need to opt for a holistic approach. Different UN agencies and other parties have been working on this matter of uh, multilingualism and uh, in cyber sp cyberspace in particular. Obviously, we have been advocating for a multi-stakeholder but holistic approach. We do complement each other in, uh, in, uh, in, in making the internet truly multilingual. We need to support communities to use the internet and digital resources in the language that they understand, that they master, and to have access to the content which is meaningful for them so they can create value through that content and contribute by also creating uh, uh, content themselves. And that's the type of virtuous circle that we could create. So let me here end my remarks by saying that UNESCO is fully committed to join forces to produce, disseminate original content in as many languages as possible. And through this holistic approach I mentioned, we can truly ensure that no one is left behind, certainly not on the ground of language in cyberspace. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much. I think we're going to clap for Doreen and Dr. Jalassi, if you don't mind. I think these were really very important remarks from both of you, and I have to say, I am also inspired by this idea of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, which is really wonderful to bring together in our kind of digital development space and ecosystem, because we cannot, as you said, as you pointed out so eloquently, we cannot have uh, a digital society that is inclusive without ensuring that people can communicate however they want to communicate in their languages. And so multilingualism is so incredibly critical. So thank you both for those inspiring keynotes. Um, we're very honored to have you here. I understand, Dr. Jalassi, that you have a plane to catch. So we excuse you when you need to uh, move. It's, it's OK. Uh, we're lucky to have many more here and online. Uh, thank you. And I am very honored, in fact, 
to go from Doreen and Dr. Jolasi giving us this really wonderful picture of the, this moment that we are living of refocusing on multilingualism with uh, the experience, to share the experience of two wonderful uh, colleagues who are living these on a day-to-day -day basis in their communities, both Alana Mancineri, an indigenous woman from the Brazilian Amazon, as well as uh, Sharad Sharma from um, India, two incredible activists that are using their local languages in very innovative ways to organize, to mobilize, to bring about connections, and using digital spaces and digital technology to increase the possibilities of communications in their communities. So I'm very honored to have Alana and Sharad here today. We're gonna to start with Alana, who is going to speak, I believe, in Portuguese or Spanish. So for those of you who need translation, prepare yourselves to go to the translation interpretation button on the Zoom. Um, and if there is a need, I can also try to help with translation uh, summaries. So Alana, you have been a communicator with your indigenous communities in the Brazilian Amazon for many years. You are also a biologist from the Federal University of Brazil, and you are an activist with indigenous women and especially with young indigenous communicators. Tell us, how do you utilize and support the use of your community's local languages for all the work that we do um, in your communities? It's an honor to have you. I'm going to pass it on to you, and I hope everyone is ready for your uh, intervention. Alana? Yes, yeah. Buenas tardes. Hola, Buenas tardes, me siga. Alana Mancineri. Actualmente, actualmente vivo en Manaus, capital de Amazonas, donde se encuentra. I currently live in Manaus, which is a city located in the Amazon region. It is the, the region is also home to the largest indigenous population in the Amazon region. I represent the Machineri community, which is an indigenous community. My grandfather was one of the leaders who created the organization that I currently work for. What is it that we do? We champion the rights of indigenous communities. Everything we do has a digital aspect. Our organization champions and supports women and the indigenous people living in the Amazon region. We are aware of the fact that very often fake news can have an adverse impact on the situation of the indigenous communities. We work across nine states located within the Amazon forests. We have more than 160 languages which are spoken across the region. It is a challenge for us right now to protect the indigenous communities during the pandemic. We are doing our utmost to combat disparities in access to the internet and to digital services. We are doing our best to support young people. Let's remember that we have 180 different indigenous peoples living in the Amazon region. Our organization also includes a network of young activists who specialize in communication. We organize a range of different events. For example, in August this year, 
Our female members organized and staged protests in Brazil to protest against the disparities that I've just mentioned. We have to make sure that we are involved in all the decisions that are taken today. Muchas gracias, Alana. Thank you, Alana. It's really wonderful to hear you and how you've worked with your communities. I think we're going to see the video next. Thank you. Thank you, Alana, for sharing that beautiful video illustrating so much of the work that you and your community has done. We have applause in the room for you. I don't know if you can hear. Um, just want to make sure you know. Thank you so much. And we have a few questions for you in a little bit, but I'm going to uh, go next to Sharad Sharma. Um, Sharad, you are a cartoonist and founder of the World Comics Network, and you've worked uh, both in print and electronic media over a decade, but very much using a grassroots movement to use comics as an alternative to communicate, especially in local languages. I find it fascinating, and I, I can't wait for everyone to hear from from you and also learning from your experience. So please tell us, how have you engaged with your communities uh, in a digital environment through different local languages in your country? And welcome to this session. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, it's so wonderful to hear all the wonderful speakers from across the globe. Uh, I started as a political cartoonist myself uh, and uh, I used to work in mainstream press, first in print media, and then later on in television. And what I realized that uh, the stories are very much limited to the uh, power centers. The stories are very much concerned to the noisy minorities. And the issues which is really concerned to the silent majority are not getting the real due space and uh, uh, credit in both in media and also in the policy documents. So what was really important to get the voices from the margins and also from the uh, uh, from the periphery to how to document those voices and also uh, let the policy makers, let the people who have who are in the power centers uh, to hear those voices and also make some uh, real uh, uh, difference in their life. So what we did, uh, being a political cartoonist, what you can do, what how you can really contribute. That was a major question. And what we did, we started like uh, uh, traveling to the different part of the country across the length and breadth of this country. And the people mostly living uh, in the northeastern part of the country or in west or in the, uh, in the uh, tribal belt, they speak very different languages. And the people, those who have no access to, uh, I'm talking about, 15, 20 years back, no access to mainstream press. The regional press was very much limited to the state capitals, or these voices were not even 
heard by the mainstream or the regional press or newspapers, print media. Uh, with the invent of the internet, we thought, okay, it's a new mainstream uh, media. We, it's, a, it's a more democratized platform. But I think over the period of time, what we realized that uh, people are becoming the uh, consumer of the information and they are not creating content at the first place. And that is very unfortunate in a way that uh, it's still the same sort of people who used to dominate in the conventional press, they are still dominating in the internet spaces. Uh, when we say what is the multilingual uh, uh, internet spaces, it doesn't mean that you provide your website in uh, Hindi or in English or in two or three major languages, but it is more about how to get the voices of the people, of the majority of the people, or the people who really uh, matters in, in, in each and every region, their voices, how to document them. And it is not merely about tokenism. So it is not just simply uh, uh, providing some translation or transliteration in the, within the website or in the, in the government website, but it is more about getting the voices of the, of the people in their own languages. And one of the way we did, because uh, we started using the comics, the grassroots comics as a communication tool. And we thought that each and every person can tell a story. They have plenty of stories and issues to share. The only thing which was lacking was a, was a medium. So we started like going to the people uh, and, and, and assisting them, facilitating them that how they can document their part of stories. And please remember that this is a country where you travel 40, 50 kilometers and people speak very different language everywhere. The state are very linguistically divided. So uh, each and every places people started, our participants, our, our uh, target audience, they used to tell their local stories in local languages. So the audience, uh, the creator from the, the to content to the audience, everything was very deep local. And the the process we did initially uh, was black and white format, photocopy format, so that the resources are not a big hindrance there. Uh, so, so people used to produce their local content, they used to photocopy it, and they used to distribute it locally. So the, so the local issues used to get uh, their due uh, attention locally everywhere. And once the issue was uh, distributed locally, mainstream media was forced to uh, document those stories. But with the invent of the internet, we realize how to document these voices, how people will come uh, forward and they will also uh, start like uh, uploading their stuff because most of the people there who are using and 80% and of the population in India, they use internet through their mobile devices. So they are not simply, uh, they don't have like uh, 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 high bandwidth maybe most of the time. Or, or the even uh, even the uh, they don't have sometimes the uh, power connection or the electricity to to charge their devices. Maybe they were they are getting elect their internet connectivity. So the connectivity is a very very uh, illusionary term in a way that okay maybe you are getting connectivity but not the uh, not able to charge your device and not able to con create your content, not able to upload it. So that's a very I think it's a. Uh, uh, depriving them from their basic human rights. And, 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 and we have experienced this during the time of COVID when most of the people with the high bandwidth, they used to get access of, or they used to get enrolled in the vaccination. And most of the people with living even in the capital city, like in Delhi, they were not able to uh, even uh, enroll for their vaccination. So you can see this kind of things is happening across the uh, 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 like section across the country. So how the medium were not only just like simply providing translation or the or alternative language uh, or text available, that is not really sufficient. What is really required to have more and more localized content, more and people, more and more people should come forward and they should document their stories, upload and and uh, and, and, and occupy that space. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Shara. That's really interesting. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Are you going to uh, share any slides or we or not? This is, okay. I just want to make sure that I didn't miss anything with the technical team. Okay, this is wonderful. Thank you and thank you to Alana. Is Alana still online? I just want to make sure we didn't lose her. Great. Um, we have a few questions for both of you, and uh, Raquel is going to help me with questions that may also be online from the participants. Um, I wanted to start actually with Alana. Both of you really talked about storytelling as such an important element of what multilingualism and uh, using different languages have facilit has facilitated, but also in the case of Alana, movement building, which I think is really interesting for communities to be involved online and to use online tools in a way that is useful to them. So, Alana, I wanted to start with you, and I was wondering if you could share with all of us, what are some of the techniques and strategies that uh, women and youth in your community use with digital uh, technology to not only facilitate movement building, but also knowledge sharing, to be able to be connected and support each other. Uh, I'm especially interested in something that you shared with me before that I would like you to share with everyone around, um, it's not just about the written language, but it's also about oral, verbal, and voice uh, stories. So tell us a bit about that, and then we'll go to uh, Sharad. Thank you. Of course, thank you for asking this question. Our organization is developing resources and materials, but we do not only rely on the written language, we also rely on the oral language. Let's remember that in our region, in the Amazon region, there is a huge diversity of um, indigenous peoples. We have 180 different groups, and these indigenous groups boast a culture which is largely based on oral tradition. And that's why we want to do our best to support native languages. At the same time, we are trying to support and help indigenous people to communicate with the outside world so we work with the indigenous peoples but at the same time we want to help them to communicate with the outside world we are also engaged in political activity of sorts i would like to tell you that communication is a tool that we use in political activity so i'm not only referring to communication in a general sense. That's why we are doing our best to prepare women and to prepare young people through communication to be able to be active in the field of politics. We want young people and we want women representing all of the indigenous peoples living in the Amazon to be better prepared to take an active role in politics. Let me remind you that Spanish is not used in Brazil, neither is English. Portuguese is the main language that is used in the country. So we introduce solutions for people who would like to communicate in the official languages of the UN. In my region, 31 indigenous languages are spoken, which attests to this great diversity that we have in the country. If you compare French 
to Portuguese, you will see that there are huge differences between the two. But if you compare those 30 plus indigenous languages, you will also see striking differences between them. People tend to think that the indigenous languages are all the same, but that is not the case. So that is my point of view. That is our point of view. We want to engage with young people in our activities. Thank you, Alana. That's very interesting. Um, and it's, it's such a complex uh, system of keeping communication alive as well, which I'm hearing you and I'm thinking here we are at IGF uh, trying to communicate amongst all of us uh, online, offline, <laughs> you know, here at the, in the room. And we have challenges on a day to day basis. Your communities have a multitude of challenges that we cannot even uh, imagine. And I, and I think your movement and your community and you as a leader of your community are really facilitating not only communication but facilitating people's livelihoods through allowing them to be able to not only use their language but communicate with others um, in new ways so thank you for sharing that it's so interesting to learn from you and Sharad uh, one of the things you know as I was listening to Alana you are using a tool another mechanism another strategy through comics and and storytelling to not not only allow people to have those stories and to create their own, to uh, share their own stories, but to create new content, right? And so I wanted to ask you about that before we go to the audience questions. In what ways do you, have you seen that the ability of creating that content has also increased uh, the interest, the motivation of other communities to, uh, to do the same, to replicate those experiences as they see their peers starting to share some of these very rich history and way to communicate amongst themselves? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, this campaign we started called Cyber Salama, and this was a campaign to uh, address the next half billion population, we call it. Who is the next half billion NHPs? They are the people who are uh, uh, forced to use the internet or mobile devices, or because of the lockdown and before that demonetization situation in India. And these communities are this huge population uh, they have no, as such, basic literacy on their technology. One, uh, they are, most of these people are not literate. Most of the content is available in, only in English. And their kids or their uh, school-going children or somebody, their neighbor, who are, also have very half-baked information, they are the one who are passing some information to them. So what is happening that people, once they have some sort of like digital uh, some financial fraud or some, some issue with their uh, hacking with their, their devices, mobile or laptop or anything, they are losing faith in internet. And uh, how, the, how to bring more and more people towards the inter internet and restore their faith in the internet, that is one of the main questions. And what we did, we started like going to the people to, and asking them to document their my mobile story. And what is my mobile story where each and every internet user is documenting their story and sharing their mobile experience. Most of the experiences are about, most of the people are not able to do, uh, the, attend the online classes. Uh, that, that's a big, huge uh, digital divide which is really happening still in, in the country. And the second, uh, about how beautifully, the positive side of the internet also, that how beautifully they started like learning so many things through YouTube videos and so on, and 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 multiple things they are uh, they are doing. But one of the story uh, created by uh, 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 this very young girl, and it was very interesting that how uh, she created. Uh, she was only uh, primary school uh, uh, level pass out, and once she was enrolled in one of the NGO program. What she did, she started going to the community and she started helping them to fill the widow pension form, elderly pension form, or how to get the ration through the public distribution system and so on. So that is very, very interesting that how uh, people who have very limited uh, uh, education and also very limited information about the internet, they are also beautifully using internet for the benefit of the larger society. And that is a very positive side of the of these campaigns. The backdrop of uh, 
uh, uh, uh, you can see there, there are people who are pasting comics, they are creating comics. These are the people, uh, Rohingya refugees. And these refugees, they created stories in their local languages. And these stories are also getting resonate in digital spaces. So these are the communities who are really uh, feeling that maybe they don't have uh, uh, the ability to draw well or ability to tell a good story, but still they can communi communicate using this powerful tool of line drawing and the grassroots comics. So this is what is really happening in these spaces. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. I think that reminds me of a saying that technology is only good when it's really for the people, right? When it works for people for what they need. And I think what you just shared with us is a perfect example of that, this technology that is meaningful and really serves a purpose to improve people's lives, however they decide that that improvement takes place. So um, thank you for that. Um, I just have to apologize to you because I think there was some confusion about some slides or a video that you had. And I don't know if it's possible to share now, but it may be that later on in the session, we'll be able to pull them up. So I just wanted to tell you we are aware of it, but we were having some technical issues uh, from the stage and the rest of the tech team. So I, I just want you to know we did not forget, but uh, we are trying to see if we can make it happen. So this is really wonderful. Thank you, Alana and Sharad. Really great to hear from you and to learn from you. And I'm going to pass on to my co-moderator, Silvia Cadena, that you've met, many of you met in the session before. Silvia is the co-chair of the Policy Network on Meaningful Access with me, and she's also um, a director at APNIC, very active woman in our digital development space. Many of you know her. I'm going to pass it on to her to moderate the next session, and she'll introduce that to you. Thank you, Silvia. On to you. Gracias, Sonia, and thank you very much for promoting me to director. <laughs> I am head of programs of the APNIC Foundation. Uh, very happy to uh, join you remotely uh, from Brisbane, Australia. So it's uh, a little bit after 1 a.m. for me. So my apologies if my voice uh, sounds a little bit croaky. Uh, I have the pleasure uh, to moderate uh, the next uh, block uh, that is going to talk about, to focus on universal acceptance. And in this block, we have uh, three amazing uh, speakers that um, will be uh, sharing with us um, from their, their perspective about how, um, you know, after Sherad and, and Alana have shared with us, these great experiences about why we do what we do, all the effort that goes into making the internet work and efforts around affordability, efforts around uh, connectivity, efforts around measuring it, e efforts around uh, bringing the different languages in. Um, this, this medium, this um, a distribution channel for all of that local content uh, is facilitated technically uh, through a number of, of mechanisms. And universal acceptance is one of those um, uh, challenges. So um, with that, I'm going to pass the microphone to uh, Ram Mohan. He's the chief operating officer of Aphelias, uh, which is the second largest internet domain name company in the world has successfully uh, sold to the private equity firm Ethos Capital in December 2020. Ram uh, has over 20 years of experience in technology, leadership, and entrepreneurship um, with, with, uh, within both uh, publicly listed and private companies, uh, a cybersecurity expert. Uh, he co-founded the, the Security and Stability Advisory Committee for the Internet, which provides advice on major threats um, to internet infrastructure, and he has served on the ICANN board for many years as the inventor of uh, 17 U.S. Uh, patents for his work in internet technology, and he's a wonderful human being. So welcome, Ram. Um, please, uh, over to you. Gracias, uh, Silvia. Thank you so much, and I, I hope you can all hear me um, clearly. Um, it's really, uh, really a pleasure and an honor to be part of this session um, where we're speaking about a connected planet and meaningful access to the internet for all of us who are already connected and those of us who are going to be connected. When so much of the world's communities 
communicate with each other and between each other in their own languages, why is it that we must use the ASCII script to use the internet, to navigate the internet? It didn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense uh, anymore. Um, and it's really not for lack of technology, nor is it for lack of desire or for lack of effort. So the ability of the world to use their own languages on the internet, on the domain name system, the technology exists for it. The clearly, because we, all of us, uh, communicate with each other in our own languages, we have some bridge languages, English certainly is one of them, but we have uh, so much of our culture, our dreams are in our languages. Our dreams are to be communicatable also on the internet in our own languages. Now, if you want to do that, the foundation for all of that is this idea that I've been calling universal acceptance. It's a phrase that I coined in 2001 when I discovered that websites and emails uh, just would not accept my email address. I had an email address that ended in .info, I-N-F-O. And you know, info stands for information in 37 languages in the world, except on the internet. Info stood on the internet at that time for your email is unrecognized. Info stood on the internet at that time for your email is going to bounce. Info stood for we cannot register your, uh, yourself on this website because we don't recognize this domain name. You know, and then a few years later, we started to, to bring local languages uh, in, 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 our, in various identities on the internet and the problem only became worse. Website said, I don't know why you're, you're writing something from right to left. Did you, did you not know that the inter, on the internet, everything must be written from left to right? Well, we, we, we know that that's not the, the truth, but there were programs and systems and applications on the internet that really had not um, made the switch to say, that the languages of the world and the people of the world who use these languages, the internet has to adapt to make sure that all of the people of the world and the languages that they speak, uh, that it be able to accommodate all of that. So that, my friends, is really what universal acceptance is. The acceptance of your languages, your scripts, on the domain name system in a way so that you actually don't even recognize that there is a technology called the internet that is standing in the way of your communication, standing in the way of your connectivity. So in, in uh, a few years ago, I uh, created a, a, a global uh, nonprofit group called the Universal Acceptance Steering Group. And that was an idea to bring together industry, academia, civil society, regulators, to solve this problem of universal acceptance. It's not a technology problem. It's not a problem of desire not being existing. It's not a problem of lack of effort. It's actually a problem of making sure that the internet's systems, the websites, the applications, the apps, all of those systems make the necessary changes to recognize finally that the people of the world require, in fact, the people of the world demand that their languages be accessible and, and their identity finally have a role on the global internet that we all come uh, to depend upon every day. So that really is the foundation of universal acceptance. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Uh, I was going to say we are a little bit over time, but thank you so much for wrapping it up uh, so beautifully. Um, I have a few questions for you, uh, but I probably will move first to Daniele and Maria and try to um, see how, how we go with questions from the audience as well. Um, so Daniel is our next speaker, Daniel uh, Fink. Uh, he works at ICANN since 2014 and is based in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So uh, welcome uh, to the session. He acted as head of science and technology for the embassy of Brazil in Seoul mm -hmm. and holds a PhD in managed sciences from the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, KAIST. Uh, previously joining ICANN, uh, Daniel was the executive director of the Net Mundial Initiative. So welcome, Daniel, to the stage. Thank you very much, Silvia. Hello, everybody. Just say hello to, to Sonia, to, to Raquel there in Poland. It's an honor to be here joining, joining Ram and Maria on this session, founders, pioneers of the universal acceptance efforts in ICANN. And, uh, I'll just share with you what we are doing. Uh, I was kindly invited by Roberto Zambrana from Bolivia, which I thank him very much for this opportunity, uh, just to share what we did in our region, what other regions within ICANN communities are doing for the universal acceptance. And uh, I have a surprise. I have an invitation for you. I'll tell you during this session. Thank you so much. Sorry, Daniel, have you finished? My apologies. Yes, waiting the for sound. this question. Oh, okay. okay. Um, yeah. I thought you were going to give your remarks first, um, or you want to just uh, dive into the, the dialogue. Uh, I'm, I'm okay either way. Uh, sorry, I'm just following the run sheet and I, I, I don't see that uh, bit, my apologies. Oh, okay, just waiting for your questions, no worries. Okay, okay. Um, well. In, in, in that regard, then, could you please share with us which are the initiatives uh, in, in activities that ICANN is working on to support the multilingual internet? And um, what are the opportunities for collaboration that you envision? Okay, thank you so much. Well, um, <laughs> since 2015, thanks to, to Ram and other uh, stakeholders from ICANN, we have this beautiful uh, group promoting the, the, the acceptance of uh, internet addresses and emails on all the systems, which is the universal acceptance uh, steering group. From my view, as, as I can staff, it's, it's really easy to fall in love for this, for this project because the, the challenge is really huge and uh, the opportunity to engage with um, several new community members, so to say, like developers, everybody who runs the system on the internet, uh, to make sure uh, it will be adapted to support these new addresses that Ram just mentioned, not just the dot .info, right, Ram, but also scripts in, in Chinese, Korean, Japanese. So it's a huge effort that, that we have. ICANN has included that in, the, in his strategic plan to support from 2021 to 2025. So for us, it's a huge priority. And we are conducting all possible efforts, even beyond our, our remits, to reach out, teach, engage, connect to experts, to everybody who runs the system and uh, needs to, to update, to prepare for the new modern identifiers that uh, we are preparing. And I mean modern identifiers, I mean uh, specifically uh, these identifiers who will uh, support multilingualism on, on internet. I like to, to, to say during our speeches here, like uh, have a reflection. So what if internet was invented in, in India, for example, and uh, we would have all the browsers, everything in something different than our Latin scripts. So think about, so this is the importance. So many uh, countries that we talk that use the Latin script, it's natural in our region. And um, we also tell them, hey, you should prepare for your future customers that will have an email in Chinese, in any other script. So if you are not prepared, like uh, you may lose business at first, right? And second, we should be ready to, to talk with people in their own uh, languages. And this is very important. So many good things to, to happen and we are like open. 
Thank Good you, morning. Daniel. Uh, one, one last question, and I, I would like to ask you to be brief. Uh, what will you think is the one biggest challenge for ICANN uh, to achieve, with the, that ICANN identifies to achieve the multilingual internet? Okay. Uh, ICANN's habitat in the ecosystem is uh, very focused on internet identifiers. So we are DNS people. So we like IP numbers, we like DNS servers, and we don't, historically, we don't work with uh, Java developers, PHP developers, database developers, and things like that. However, now is the time to talk with them, right, Ron? Uh, now is the time to engage with them and uh, share with them uh, what they should do to prepare their systems. So there it comes, the, the great work of you know, Universal Acceptance Steering Group, preparing documents, best practices, training, to make it easy for them to, to adapt, right? So it, it's a global effort. It's very challenging because we mostly need to talk with everybody, from companies from all sizes, developers from, from all the world. Uh, but there are many good news, for example, Mr. Savio Moraes, sitting there in Poland, is one of the greatest experts of universal acceptance. And he's from Brazil. Say hello, Savio, to everybody there. <laughs> so if you have any questions, you can uh, talk with them. We work from 2017. Savio started doing some research on acceptance in Brazil. Now he's helping other countries. And uh, the good news I have to tell you is that we are preparing a great training with our community uh, of internet users in, in North America. So we will have um, four sessions, long sessions, technical sessions, uh, starting from January. And I will share in the chat the link for you if you are interested in learning how to prepare your system. Please join this training to be in English with great instructor, uh, Dr. Sarmad Hussein, my colleague from, from Pakistan, uh, Shampika, our instructor from Australia, <laughs> will come and teach and so on. I'll put the link here in the chat. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, I, I would like to, to move uh, to our uh, last speaker, Maria Kolesnikova, uh, Chief Analyst of the Coordination Center for the TLD that manages the, the .ru uh, domain name. Uh, Maria has been a project manager for, for the TLD.ru uh, since October uh, 2011. Um, it, the company manages Russia's national top level domains, including .ru and the, the .ru in Russian, which I can't say. Uh, prior to that, uh, Maria uh, had been the head of marketing department since the first um, since she first joined the company in 2007, and has a great experience in telecommunications and sales. Uh, Maria, we are very lucky to have you. Um, I have a few um, uh, questions for you. Uh, I would like to give you a couple of minutes to do um, your initial remarks, um, and then I will hit you with a couple of questions, and we will go back to Ram uh, for um, one one last uh, couple of questions also. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you so much. Yes, I'm uh, Maria Kalesnikova. I'm representing the Coordination Center for TLD.RU and .RF, so you can call it .RF. It means Russian Federation. So uh, in Cyrillic, and uh, yes, we are quite a long time connected with their issues um, on internationalized domain names and the mail addresses on the internet and the evaluation of uh, the uh, internet to go from the ASCII to Unicode one. So lots of experience and practice. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you Maria. Um, I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about what has the, the government um, has done in, in Russia to promote Russian languages, language, sorry, uh, content and domains, increasing credibility um, and better access locally. Would you, would you mind to share a little bit of that? Uh, yes, of course. So uh, I would say that yes, in 10 years ago, when we have launched the .rev domain name, we re get the high level support from our government and our president of that time, Dmitry Medvedev, and there was was uh, the high level support to the delegation processes um, by ICANN and IANA and uh, the great promotional 
campaign all over the country. So now this government continue to support uh, Cyrillic domain names. They use it for the official websites. For example, during the pandemic uh, period, uh, the main official website to inform Russian citizens on the situation with COVID-19 was uh, addressed by the .rf domain name. Stop coronavirus RF. So all the official um, state bodies they have the website that are on the Russian language. So the content of all uh, almost all our websites are on Russian language. Of course, this is the official language of the country, and most of them are addressed with daughter of the main names as well. So uh, our daughter of the main name is is a the second in the world by the number of registered domains and 70 percentage of them are in real use to address websites and mail addresses. But to speak about the promotion of local content, I would say that still access, internet access is the main issue. And in our country, we have quite a high level of internet access, about uh, 75 percentage of penet internet penetration. So we uh, it covers uh, around 124 million internet users in the country so and uh, we spend in on online about seven hours a day in average our children can start to use internet since two years old actually <laughs> so this is i think this is a great basement for this and uh we but we still have some national programs in place to uh, increase this accessibility so governments are uh, work on in connect connection of the social important objects like hospitals, medical centers, schools, and uh, so uh, the locations where can live only up to 100 persons. So they still continue to increase it. And from the other hand, uh, they have new initiative last year. They um, initiated the providing the free internet access for some internet resources. It means you shouldn't pay to your telecom and mobile operator for access to these websites and online services. This is mostly government services, but some of them are really popular online services that uh, for citizens. And of course, these um, resources, yes, addressed by uh, Russian TLD domain names and, and on Russian language. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Maria. Uh, sorry to to cut yes, you short. Okay. Um, this this will bring me back uh, to the question that I want also to ask. Um, to Ram at the beginning about what what you know all of you actually. Uh, what do you guys think that the, the all the CCTLDs and the regulators could do to encourage local content and local uh, language access? And what other um, sort of partnerships or collaborations do you think are important uh, at national level uh, to, to try to preserve many of the languages uh, that were mentioned uh, on the first intervention by the, doc the doctor from um, UNESCO that addressed us at the beginning. So Ram, over to you. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah. I think this is, a, this is a place where regulators can do a great deal. Um, and I, I have one idea that I'd, I'd love for the regulators, especially who are participating in the IGF and who are uh, listening in um, to think about, what if you, in your procurement contracts, in, your, uh, in the various procurement components that you have, um, have, a, have a piece that says that organizations or companies that are UA ready will have a preference that you will allocate uh, you know, some level of an extra points or extra consideration um, for organizations that are ready. I posit to you that something like that, a small change uh, at, the re at the regulatory level, uh, especially when it comes to procurement, uh, is likely to prompt a dramatic uh, increase in universal acceptance and universal access to multilingual content on the internet. Thank you, Ram. Uh, I'm just wondering if there is any reaction from Daniel or from Maria. I don't see your videos, so I can't. I can't tell. Okay. So. I, I can share my opinion. I would also suggest uh, to governments and uh, other entities, interested parties, to use IDN domain names and internationalized emails themselves so they can feel better their user experience and face all the problems that uh, they have right now. 
That's an excellent advice, Maria. Daniel and yourself? Thank you, Jeff. I fully agree with Maria and, and Ram. Just to add that uh, we also have a working group within the, the government advisory committee in ICANN. So all your governments already have uh, representatives on this group. And uh, for sure, you'll have people to, to reach out to, to learn about, more about uh, universal acceptance and how to uh, follow the recommendations from Ram. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I, you know, I was part of one um, IDN uh, committee back when I was pregnant, uh, trying to bring uh, Spanish into the picture. My son just graduated high school, so 18 years on, and we're still talking about it, right? So, is uh, it? it Still, the the line is not there yet, right? In in many places. So, I I don't know. It takes time. Uh, as as Daniel really said it very clearly, it's not lack lack of love, lack of attention, lack of interest. It's, it's just a collection of of challenges. And uh, you you really make me think about what will happen if the inventions uh, come from different places. Like you said, what if the internet was invited invented in 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 India? Then we will be having a completely different conversation around what, what's going on. And uh, that actually connects very powerfully with uh, some of the comments that were made in the previous session that you, you, you were not with us on the policy network for meaningful access, where a lot of the speakers were talking about uh, how important it is uh, to connect to something from, where, from which you draw meaning and that languages are part of our identity and express who we are, our needs, just as powerful as Alana uh, shared from the experience in the Amazon and the experiences from Sharat in India uh, for people that are in, in a lot of cases illiterate and that you can use just drawings to express their frustrations, their needs and their aspirations through cartoons. Um, so I, I think that there are, uh, when, when I started working on internet development, um, it was only text. Um, it, so, so that was that was a thing, it was a bit net that, that when I started working and there was no images that could be um, uh, transmitted. And it was amazing efforts trying to explain in a limited number of characters uh, because we were paying by the character to upload and download. So it was more expensive to upload than to download, uh, to explain the, what we were seeing to a farmer in Colombia, to a farmer in India, uh, and ex exchange that, that information about what was going on uh, with their cows or uh, techniques that they needed to practice and how much the power of images and the power of, of uh, how you interpret yourself through your culture comes from the words that you are able to, to um, uh, express. Uh, for me, speaking of Spanish and uh, not enough coffee, coffee almost at two in the morning, Spanish is, start, start, uh, is starting to show up in my brain. So I, I, I will probably not even attempt to summarize all the brilliant comments from Doreen um, uh, from uh, Dr. Desil, uh, from Maria, from Daniel, from Ram, uh, just to thank everyone for the participation and try to check with Raquel if maybe we have any questions from the chat or questions in the room. I don't, I don't see the room, so I'm not sure if there is anyone on a microphone uh, over there um, uh, waiting to ask a question or if anyone wants to type something on the chat. Hi, Silvia. Silvia, first of all, thank you very much for uh, being with us till 2 a.m. I hope you can get your deserved rest pretty soon. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Raquel Gato. Uh, I'm supporting both the PNMA and the UAMC uh, main sessions. Um, let me look at the room and see if there are any questions. We do have um, uh, support to bring you the microphone. There is one in the back. Um, the lady in pink. Oh, sorry. There is one. Uh, just can I take this one first, and then, uh, yeah. Okay. We have two questions. Um, good. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Andrews Bass. I'm with the Global Peace Ambassador, and I want to know how the digital, since we're trying to 
put everything in this perspective of mental language languages, how we can use the internet to promote peace, that global peace we all wanted. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I'm going to take the one in the back and then we go back to the today's speakers uh, who want to comment on that. And we have a question here from the stage from uh, Giacomo. Can you introduce yourself, please? And, and <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Mary Uduma. <laughs> okay, 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 Siva. Um, my question is, how do we implement multilingualism in IGF uh, meetings? Uh, because I, I'm just coming from um, a, a session that uh, uh, somebody was speaking in French. We couldn't go, we, we couldn't understand. And they will speak in English, the French uh, participants would not understand. Can we start from uh, Jerusalem, according to the holy books? That is, make it happen in IGF. So we translate our, our meeting, our, our programs, our sessions, and also allow uh, anybody that wants to hold a workshop in their own language to do so. That's my question. I think we need to address that if we we'll continue to have meaningful meetings uh, so that some, some, some participants will not just come here and roam around and go without knowing what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, and I'm so sorry, my dear friend Mary, <laughs> that I couldn't recognize. Part is the mask, part is my bad vision, <laughs> but uh, thank you very much. And we do have a third question uh, from Giacomo Massoni, who is here with me at stage. Yes, my question is to this, uh, the panelists, because um, it's been proposed that uh, institution will use um, IDNs for their public communication. That's very good, but um, one of the main problems we have with the domain name is that um, currently, if you apply for a domain name in IDN, this is a separate question and request than if you apply for the same name in another uh, IDN system. So uh, this complicates life enormously. While I think that for the next round would be very useful if you, when you apply for one set of language, you can apply for the same domain in all the set of languages eventually. Thank you very much, Giacomo, and also for stepping in to be <laughs> uh, my, uh, my partner here at stage. Uh, so Silvia, um, I don't know if you got the three questions. We have one question about peace. Uh, how can we bring also peace uh, to the internet? The question about the sessions, the other sessions in the IGF that needs to also to, to bring multilinguisms and that one, uh, I can also offer uh, perhaps uh, that it could be a call to action uh, at the end of this session. But, uh, and then uh, Giacomo's questions on the next round and uh, how to, to include the IDNs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel, for, for your help with the questions uh, on site. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure Sharad and Alana have their cameras off, so I don't know if they would like to try and have a stab at any of the questions, um, but um, I will give the floor um, probably, you know, to, I'm not sure if Alana, no, Alana is not. Um, I don't know. I was hoping that Alana was around to, to talk a little bit about peace in the Amazon. I think that she made a couple of very strong uh, comments on her intervention. But I mean, if she's not uh, uh, logged in at the moment, probably have. I can for sure. Yes, please go ahead, Charat. Yeah, so uh, what we have been doing that uh, in the media literacy, especially, uh, we realized because with the uh, excess use of this uh, WhatsApp and uh, Facebook and other social media platform, 
there's a lots of misinformation is being spread across the country and in last few years in fact in last decade we have been experiencing uh, a number of mob lynchings a conflict which is happening because of the misinformation malinformation fake news and so on and people without even uh, uh cross checking the source of the information they are forwarding this information uh most of the people even the educated people who thinks okay because they are living in the eco so called eco chambers and they think the whatever the information is coming since it is coming from somebody they know about or somebody they can rely on or because they think the person is uh, their relative or somebody who is in the good position but people are not realizing the basic fact that they should go to the reliable websites news website or reliable sources it is it happened during the covid time as well as during the uh, conflict which is happening in different part of the country or across the globe so what i think is the uh, best thing what we can do to counter the conflict and to restore peace that how to really educate people about uh, uh the how to uh, consume the information how to rely on the source of information how to cross check the information and that that is possible only if you could embed this into the school curriculum into the college curriculum and also make it part of the out of school people how to reach out to the larger population which is using internet so widely without any restriction and without any uh, check and balances and that i think uh, otherwise it is going to be alarming in coming days thank you sharad um you know coming from a country that has been at war for since before i was born i i going to give a couple of more minutes to the questions about peace because i think is what is the most important thing in in the world so i would like to have a contrasting view complementary view to that So Ram, if you don't mind to bring us a little bit of that conversation from the technical side, that would be great. Thank you. So sure. thank, thank you, Sylvia. And that was such a uh, an insightful uh, question. Uh, you know, if you look at peace as the presence of harmony, um, then what we actually find is that the languages of the world are not yet in harmony with where the internet is. and that really is a, a big part of why uh, efforts like universal acceptance make a big difference because that is an effort to bring harmony um to the world's languages and to the way the people of the world express themselves um to make that you know come together on the internet um and once you have that then perhaps you can begin conversations which then hopefully lead us to the path of peace thank you ram uh very very powerful words um i would like to uh follow up with the question uh from uh eh diacomo around registering the domain in different languages at once uh so i guess that will go probably to maria and daniel and try and figure out uh how that goes Please, Daniel. Okay, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Jacmo, for for this question. And yeah, as you know, at this time we are working on a second round of new GTLDs, including uh, IDNs. So uh, this topic is is a really uh, good discussions we we are having. And um, um, let's see how the the new uh, applications guidebook comes out. and um uh, for 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 this problem because we we had the, the the first round and it took time to to launch a second one just because we wanted to make sure to evaluate all the issues all the the the, the suggestions for improvement and this is what we not not we just as organization but i can as a community is preparing now for for the for the next round that will be launched in the coming years i'll get back to you with this specific question once we have a decision jackmo waiting to to hear from maria as well gracias daniel maria over to you um this is a really hard question because it concerns all the registries actually so 
if they can agree between themselves, so to make such a preventing registrations <laughs> or stop lists in their uh, re registries. So I, I don't think this uh, we have uh, the uh, decision right now. But from the other side, I actually don't think it's it, it also have some some great sense because so all the uh, ideas they are mostly for the local markets actually. So if you see, they are very popular on local markets and for special uh, communities that speak on that language. So and that is clear for them what they mean, and there is not, not a big sense to use the IDN in other I don't know. Uh, languages as well so why you don't need to use it so you have your in your lo local language for your local website that's enough i think thank you maria um i i i, I don't know if anyone else uh, would like to try to answer uh the question from uh, my my dear maria uh mary uduma uh, well but i i probably want to say that walking the talk is very difficult uh, trying to live what we preach is very complicated. And um, sometimes we make compromises and uh, sometimes those compromises take very long uh, for communities to stand, stay away from those compromises and be more inclusive. And languages are a thing. Um, just when we were preparing for this particular session, uh, trying to make sure that Alana's uh, powerful presentation was in a language that she was comfortable speaking. Um, I want to congratulate her for speaking in Spanish, although her nat native uh, language is Portuguese, and we were trying to figure out how that was going to work, and she did beautifully. But it's, it's a challenge that we, you know, different people face in different times, but it tells us about what is who designed this, right? And I, I think that goes back to the, the comment from Danielle about what will happen if, if the technology is designed in a different place. And maybe that also probably connects with ideas around supporting local innovation and try to support local solutions where uh, people that understand the language and the, the needs of a particular community can come up with um, ways to uh, represent it in the devices, and the platforms, the systems, and the services that, that connect us uh, uh, to the internet. So I, I think we have um, five minutes left. Uh, so Raquel, if there are other questions in the room or if any of the session organizers would like to uh, say a few words at the end, I can see Susan still is still with us. Uh, so Susan, if you would like to, to say a few words, <laughs> I don't know, I can't see the room, so I'm not sure if there is anyone uh, on the microphone, um, but I, I really want to acknowledge everyone that has gone through the weirdness of a hybrid event and survived it, and we all get a, a golden sticker at the end. So, Susan, over to you. Thank you kindly, Sylvia, and um, this has been a tremendous session. Thank you so much for co-moderating with Sonia, and thank you, Raquel, and everybody, to all of the panelists who have joined us today, and to all of the speakers. I just thought to maybe share, um, you know, the Secretariat has asked us to prepare a few key takeaways from the session. So I've been taking notes. And so I thought perhaps I could share. I believe Susan dropped or? Yeah, we lost the audio from Susan. I'm sorry. Um, Rural connectivity issues. Uh, so unfortunately, I can hear myself over. Uh, there we go. That's better. Um, so just I think it's uh, Doreen highlighted that multilingualism has been um, an issue. Well, identified as an important issue since uh, the Tunis agenda since um, WISIS in 2005. Um, we cannot have a digital society that is inclusive um, if people cannot communicate in their own languages. Um, I thought the illustrations from Alana and Sharad were extremely important and very powerful. And then I... Since we lost uh, Susan again, uh... Sorry, Susan, rural connectivity for you. <laughs> there you go. Living on a farm. 
Um, but I, I think um, I appreciated Ram's uh, establishing the connection between um, the importance of developing local content and universal acceptance as the kind of the foundational under technical underpinning um, that uh, can enable delivery of that content and can facilitate a multilingual internet. So um, before I cut off again, uh, Hello to all of our colleagues in Poland. Thank you for joining us. And again, thank you to our co-moderators and our, our wonderful speakers today. Gracias, Susan. Thank you, everyone. I, I think we did okay with time. Uh, and I, I hope that um, the report and all the additional information that will be shared uh, later will continue to nurture this, this conversation. Is uh, as long as these languages live and as long as we try to preserve them uh, with the technology and the work that we do to make the internet ours, um, we, we will have a better and a multilingual internet. So thank you very much for, for joining us and for your wonderful uh, interventions from all the speakers and the questions from the floor. Thank you, Raquel, for all your support and so, uh, see you later. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Obrigada. Gracias. Gracias. <laughs> we survived. <laughs>